And I'll also tell you there's more things coming. This one that I'm going to create right now, I'm going to take the audio that I'm doing right now, I'm going to put slides to it, post it on there so that you can see what I'm talking about. I'm going to take the time to do that because understanding how your body works in the cold is critical to your safety, to your comfort. And if you start looking, you say, I got cold hands. What's going on here? Well, there's several things that can cause them to be cold. One of the things that we're talking about is if you have a chilly core. I don't mean your teeth are chattering. I don't mean you're, you've turned blue and you're miserable. I mean that you're no longer toasty warm. And by toasty warm, when I go back to that, that picture of these people, where they are just the, the surface of their skin, at their, their shoulders and their chest and their thighs and all around and their back and everything, it's warm. Because the surface of the skin is the, one of the other places the body will withdraw heat from. It'll start restricting the blood supply that flows right to the surface of the skin over the entire body because it doesn't want to lose as much heat. And you see if the surface of the skin is allowed to be a little cooler, you don't lose as much heat. It's one of the laws of physics about how heat transfers. We're going to talk about the science of warmth here in a little while. And so I'm talking about it's glowing, toasty, warm from the middle of your thighs to the top of your head. You know, it may be chilly on your face because it's exposed to the outside. Now then, that means the core is warm, so you take care of that first. Okay, now here's where we're going to start these slides right here. This is March of 1985, and we're headed for a three-week high Arctic performance evaluation. What we're doing is we're taking a variety of clothing up there. We have the PALS clothing made several different ways, different fabrics, different foams, as well as we have other layered systems. I have Equex. In fact, the picture that's up right now, if you look at that on the left, that is my father, Gil Phillips. He's dressed in some of his homemade PALS. You'll see that in a number of pictures. I'm standing there in Equex. I have the, uh, the camo waterproof breathable bottom on, and then I just have the, the top completely off and being exposed there because it's not all that cold where we're at at the airport. Uh, this is in March. And then uh, my friend and, and associate working with us, Kent Scott, standing uh, to the right over there, and he's wearing uh, some other uh, variety of the PALS clothing. And we're on a trip. We're going to Resolute Bay in the Northwest Territories in Canada. Now, it's no longer the Northwest Territories up there. It's called Nunavut, but at that time it was Northwest Territories. We're going to Resolute Bay. And that's hundreds of miles north of the Arctic Circle. And it's March, and it's still a good time of the year to be up there to do some camping. We wanted to get some evaluation in. One of the things that we had as an advantage to us, because I was being sponsored by Burlington International to go up there, and we now have instrumentation. You see, for years, I've talked about how this stuff performs and really feels great. But we didn't have any measurements other than, hey, I'm warm and I'm comfortable and I'm not hurting. It's 20, 30 bar low zero outside and other people are miserable and I'm not. Okay, that's a nice anecdotal story, but can we measure some things? So what we were able to do because of Burlington is we now had electronics and thermometers and all kinds of things. And here we are at Resolute Bay in the Northwest Territories, and that's kind of looking over where our campsite is. Now, since we're evaluating different clothing and sleeping bags, we're going to, and part of the time we're going to live in a tent, part of the time we're in an igloo, part of the time we're right outside. You see that uh, little insert picture down there? Uh, that, that's my father going to bed in his pal's clothing and a pal's sleeping bag just right outside, above the Arctic Circle, temperatures that are running well below zero at times. So we're out there to do this evaluation. Now, to bring us back to what we're talking about here, we have thermal couples that are taped on our bodies. And we're going to be taking thermal couple readings and logging those things so that we get an, an accurate picture of what's actually going on. Different clothing systems on, uh, different materials on, and how's it performing. Now, I started out the trip, as you saw there at the very beginning. I'm in Equex when we were at the airport. I'm now... Uh, out in the field, and I have this Equac clothing on, which is the military's extreme cold weather clothing system, as they call it. It's their 40 below zero clothing is the way they rate it. And I have on the, the Mickey Mouse boots, the VB boots, and then the, the waterproof breathable Gore-Tex shell and the layers of, uh, uh, of uh, fleece and polypropylene and those kinds of things. I have thermal couples taped to my body so that without uncovering anything, you know, you can take these thermal couple readings. We have them on our feet, on our toes, and so you can be reading those things even when the, the boots are on the footwear, we can take these readings. So let's take a look at the readings, and this is, this is a perfect, a beautiful curve of exactly what is happening. So here I am, I'm in the Equex, and we're taking, and this 
We'll start out with the shoulder temperature. That's the yellow line up at top. And uh, it's, you know, it's, I'm measuring the temperature. It's up on my shoulder. Uh, around behind, there's not a lot of venting that goes on. And you see at the end of the fourth day, there's a really low point in there. And you look at that and say, well, I don't know, that's, you know, like 79 degrees for a skin temperature. That doesn't sound so bad. Let me tell you, 79 degrees as a skin temperature on your shoulder is not happy. That is a miserable temperature to have. All right, let's throw another curve up on there. See this green line that we have on there? This is the foot temperatures. Now, notice something about that. The foot temperature is really spiky. It's way up and way down on that. In fact, in this next uh, picture, you'll see the, the E stands for exercise. Those were periods of exercise. Even with exercise, you know, you can warm the feet up, but when the exercising stops, they crash, and the feet are cold. In fact, one of the things I want to point out, we don't even have the low temperatures on my feet because the, that uh, first uh, green arrow there to the left that morning and then the second green arrow to the left, both of those mornings, my feet were numb. Now, we didn't measure the lowest temperature because when I woke up and I couldn't feel my feet if I was wiggling my toes or things like that, I'm out of bed working on those things because when you can't feel them, when they've stopped hurting, you don't know if you got frostbite or not. I'm concerned about that. We did not take temperatures. I've got them uh, in, in my hands, and I'm rubbing them, and I'm, I'm doing everything I can to warm those things up and trying to warm up these poor, miserable VB boots that I'm wearing to get my feet in them and fresh socks and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so we don't even have the low temperatures in there. But since my feet were numb, most people will lose a sensation, will lose feeling. They'll go numb. Somewhere around, I'll say, maybe 36 degrees up to about 42 degrees kind of depends on the individual. So I had temperatures that were in the very low 40s or mid to high 30s those two mornings. Those are not happy temperatures. Something else uh, as we throw on there, we'll put on the, the blue line, which is the core temperature. This is internal core temperature as measured. And you see it has this steady decline. It's going down over the first one, two, three, and four days that we're out there. Now, let's analyze a little bit of what's going on. In this red circle, I mean, there's some interesting curves right here, and they're very, very telling. First off, I would point out down at the bottom, you see circled in white, that I was actually wearing this, uh, this Equet clothing when I was having all this suffering and misery during the warmest period, thank goodness, actually. All right, now then, let's take a look over here at this foot temperature again. You see we have this lowering core temperature. It's going down day after day after day, and it's getting down to a low there at the end of day four, it's around 89 degrees. That's not a healthy temperature. That's a dangerous temperature. We're on the verge of losing something here called losing your life. As a matter of fact, if I had continued in that clothing, see, we're living outside. I, I'm doing this the way we do it with pals. We're not in heated buildings. We don't have stoves. We don't have a heated shelter, a tent with a Yukon stove or anything like that. We're staying in a tent, but it's an unheated tent, and I'm sleeping the way you're supposed to sleep in the military down sleeping bag and all these kinds of things, doing it the way they're supposed to do it. And I'm not having a really happy experience about this whole thing. So the core temperature is going down and down and down, and around uh, this fourth day we have a core temperature of about 89 degrees. And if I had stayed out there, if I, if I didn't have a way to take care of myself, I couldn't make a difference, in about a day to a day and a half, my core temperature will match the outside air temperature, which if you look down below, that's below zero. That's not a good core temperature to have, let me tell you. And you'll also notice that the E for exercise on the footwear, notice those arrows right there, that they're going down. On the first day when I exercise, I have temperatures that are up there pretty toasty, and then it goes down, and then by the third day, it's way down. On the fourth day, see that really low peak down there? That was after, I was cold. I was miserable. I was not having a happy day. And so I took a long walk uphill to try and warm myself up. And yeah, I sort of lowered the decline in the, in the shoulder temperature. You see it doesn't go down quite as steeply, but... My foot temperature jumps up to, I don't know, what about 59 degrees for a foot temperature? That is still in the major pain range. That's not a good temperature to have on your feet. So what do you do about it? Well, if you're out there in traditional clothing and traditional ways, you better go inside. You've got to uh, warm drinks and get in a strip down all your clothing and get outside of a sleeping bag with somebody else who's naked and flesh to flesh trying to warm you up and all this kind of stuff. And it's like... Yeah, those things work, but 
first of all, we don't have a sleeping bag big enough to get two people in, and we don't have any heated structure that's out there, so what do we do? Well, next slide, very simple, I just change clothing. This was the solution. Uh, at that white line that's on there, to the right of that, you know, I just put on this goofy-looking Powell's homemade foam clothing. And, yeah, it's not stylish, I'll admit that, in this. I mean, we've made things after this that are much better looking. This is just for raw performance, and I've got the raw performance because observe what happens. Take a look at the, the green foot line temperature on there. It bounces right back up almost immediately. How about the core temperature? It bounces up. Matter of fact, it overshoots a little bit because my body's metabolic rate had been cranked up on high, and now when I took all the thermal stress on it, I ran a, what looks like a fever for a while. Now, in my log and in my audio tape that I made out there, we were doing a lot of recording, I recorded, ah, I feel like I've died and gone to heaven. I mean, it felt so good to get the thermal stress off of me. That's all that I had to do was put on clothing that gave me the performance. Even though this other clothing, uh, this Equex, is rated for 40 below zero, it was not handling... 10 below zero. It wasn't handling zero very well where I'm outside living exposed all the time. The conditions were not extreme, as I pointed out. I was using Equex during the warmer part of this little trip that we were on. Okay, now some people will ask me, you know, as we look at this uh, next slide and the green arrow that points there, it says, hey, wait a minute, here you have on this Powell's Mucklock footwear kind of thing, it looks like your foot's getting cold. Well, I just graphed it the way that it is, and I was asking the same question because we were taking these readings periodically, and it says, it says my feet are getting cold. They don't feel cold. Said, something's wrong. Something's weird here. So what I did was I said, well, we sat down. We took the footwear off, and you remember seeing where I had the, uh, the tape on the toe that was in there, <clears throat> and I probably disturbed it when I had been rubbing my feet well, the days they were numb and trying to get them warmed up, and I probably started peeling up the tape, and once I got into the pal's footwear... The thermal couple had come disconnected from my toe, and it was sticking away from the toe, so it wasn't right on the warm toe. It made it look like the temperature went down. Now, the thing that you need to understand is that the body uses the extremities to help regulate core temperature. Let's think again about this picture that I was talking about, where you have the, the people that have their hood off, and then they put the hood back up, and then the hood goes off kind of a thing. That's what they're doing to regulate their core temperature was with their hood. The body will also uh, regulate the temperature or the blood flow going into the hands and feet so they may get a little bit chillier. But I want you to understand your feet are not very sensitive to the cold. You think they are because you're going like, oh, man, my feet really hurt. What I want you to understand is that if you have a shoulder temperature of 89 degrees, as I had a core temperature in there, that shoulder temperature, that is miserable on the shoulder. 89 degrees on your feet feels neutral, feels warm to most people. So the feet and the hands are generally less sensitive to the recognition of the cold so that the body can allow them to get chilly to save heat for the core and or it may pump a lot of blood out into them to say, hey, i got to get rid of some of this excess heat so I don't overheat. And it allows those temperatures to fluctuate very wildly in the hands and in the feet without great discomfort. So you'll see the foot temperature going up and down. If I showed the rest of the graphs that we took, like on my foot temperature when I'm in PALS the rest of the time, you'd see that my foot temperature would go up and down. It may drop down into the, uh, into the high 80s, and then it'd go up into the 90s, and it's up and down, because my body, this wonderful mechanism that we live in, is regulating the core temperature by allowing the feet to become to pump heat out into them or to withdraw heat from them so that the core is going to be okay. So the resolution to all of this, of course, is I changed clothing. What I learned from that was it's like, hmm, and I already had this kind of experience. I already knew what was going on, but it's like change the clothing. Don't stay in that clothing. The, the part I'll kind of chuckle about a little bit is this, that we're supposed to rotate through this clothing and uh, I'm, I started out in Equex, and it's supposed to pass on to one of the other two guys that are in this. And it's like, okay, it's your turn. I'm now in PALS. They both looked at me, my dad and my friend, and they said, uh-uh, we saw what happened to you. We're not going to wear that stuff. We don't have to. We've got enough information by watching your suffering out there that we're not going to wear it. Well, that's actually a wise decision in this case because they didn't need to, and we're now going into the colder period 
uh, for a while, so it would have been even harder to wear that stuff. So it was never worn again. And I'll, in the full classes that I do on Winter Without Worries, I give you more uh, information about this and about the sleeping system and moisture buildup and all those kinds of things. But what I'd like you to do is consider going, to, again, to safeharboralliance.com, click on that button that says Explore Winter Without Worries and PALS. It'll take you to a landing page, lots of documents, uh, PALS history, Winter Without Worries experience, and I'm going to be posting this, which will be titled Gems Resolute Bay hypothermia graph. 